back. So here we are again with Bobby Farley's Rubio. My name is Drew Bush. I'm the director of programs at the Fairbanks Museum in St. Johnsbury. And um, I hope all of you tuning in saw Bobby's excellent video from last week, building off his first outdoors segment. Um, today, our intention is for you to be able to share about your own adventures, maybe that you had in replicating some of what Bobby does in his first two videos and also to take your questions and answer them. So if you're in Zoom, you have the easiest job. You can ask questions in our Q&A box. That's a little button down at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can also chat with us and you'll see a nice welcoming chat from me there. If you're on our YouTube live stream or on Kingdom Access Television or another local cable access television station, you can also send me your questions by email. And uh, that can be before, during, or after class, because Bobby and I are happy to answer them. In fact, we've already gotten a few for today's session. So my email, if you need it, dbush at fairbanksmuseum.org. That's dbush, B-U-S-H. And we look forward to being able to answer all of your questions. And of course, I, like everybody else, am looking forward to Bobby's next video next week outdoors. But I'll turn it over to him now for to get us started. All right. Thank you, Drew. And welcome back, everyone. Now, last time we did this live update, I was outside. I was hoping to do that again. Um, but even though it's a week, uh, two weeks later, you would think that we went back in time. If you look out my window and see how much snow I've got here. And I think it was too much of a strain on the equipment to put my router sitting out in the snow and freezing. I would have to be bundled up. So I'm sorry I'm not outside, but I hope that if you've watched those videos, especially the one I made last week, that you have been able to see some of those things. The things that have emerged at this time of year know that snow and ice and cold is a possibility. So they're usually hardy. That's why, for example, the pussy willow has those furry jackets on its flowers, knowing that it could be below freezing every night when those flowers start to bloom. So you might think, crazy, it's snowing in it's late April, but that's not unusual for the Northeast Kingdom. As a matter of fact, in the Fairbanks Museum of Weather Records, um, it shows that up until the 1950s, most springs had snow in the mountains up until May. So this is actually like an old fashioned spring where we get a little bit of snow at the end of April. Not so crazy, but it also means that a lot of the progress in the blooming of flowers and the emerging of amphibians, like the frogs we talked about, is a little sort of slowed down. A lot of things have kind of taken a pause, waiting for the weather to warm up again. So not as much has changed since the video came out, but I have a huge apology to make, and I hope everybody can forgive me. I want to congratulate the folks, Meg and Ian, who actually were the first people from the public that pointed out a major mistake that I made in my video. I misidentified the leopard frog. When you see me leaning out near that pond, hearing all those quacking sounds, I could not see the frogs close enough because they would swim underwater as soon as I got within a few feet. So I misidentified them by sound and I should have known the timing because wood frogs are very early and leopard frogs come out later in the season and they sing a lot later in the season. But the other thing about wood frogs is that they get their business done, their mating in only a few days. So they might be done. They might have laid their eggs and then they become quiet. So if you got a chance to see wood frogs, I hope my video didn't miss, send you astray and tell you that they were leopard frogs, but I just want to put up a, a little picture here. Hold on a second, not my email, but here is what the wood frog actually looks like. I'll give credit to Brian Gratwick, who made this picture available online. And you actually see that it's Lithobates sylvaticus is actually the same genus as the leopard frog, but the leopard frog has a very distinctive spots. The wood frog is not as spotty at all. It's more stripy, but it's actually a frog that can come in many different colors. There are some versions that are light gray, some versions that are dark brown. So you can actually see a lot of different look wood frogs, but I want to mention the wood frogs in connection to the ones that I talked about in the video before, the peepers. That I did correctly identify. And both of these frogs, the spring peeper and the wood frog, in addition to one more frog that I'm gonna show you a picture of here, the gray tree frog, these three species have an ability to allow themselves to be frozen. This is the one of the craziest adaptations I've ever heard of in any animal. Most vertebrates, 
meaning creatures with a spine like us and frogs will die if we freeze. Insects and invertebrates can survive being frozen. Remember that woolly bear? That woolly bear basically fills his body with uh, substances that protect it from freezing, but it actually gets frozen on the inside and it doesn't die. That's not unusual for an insect. But frogs are vertebrates. They're much more complicated creatures with all kinds of soft tissues and organs that would be completely devastated by frostbite. But the wood frog, the spring peeper, the two that you heard in my video, and the tree frog, the gray tree frog that we'll hear later on if, if I'm still doing these videos in the late spring and summer, those creatures have the ability to flood their bodies with sugar. In fact, they get sugar that's stored up in their livers. And when the frosts come in the fall, they flood their body with so much sugar that they become as sweet as maple syrup. And if you have a jug of maple syrup out on your porch over the winter, you might notice that that syrup can't freeze. It gets thicker, it gets more viscous, but it never turns into a block of solid ice. And that's because the sugar interrupts the water crystals that want to turn into ice crystals that they can't, they can't get big and they can't grow into those sharp, flaky crystals that actually damage your cells. So in a weird way, that sweetness protects the frog. And well, it's an amazing adaptation. Those are the only three creatures I've ever heard that can do that anywhere around here, or maybe anywhere in the world. However, the person I learned that from is a, a great a source of information, Bern Heinrich, the professor at the University of Vermont. He wrote a book called Winter World. And that's where I first learned about this fact about these frogs. And those spring peepers, Bern Heinrich took one in the, he dug it out of the leaf litter in the early spring before it had woken up. And he stuck it in his freezer for two years. And it still survived. He popped it out of the freezer two years later. Can you imagine seeing a frozen frog in your freezer for two years and then it coming back to life? That ability is something that no other vertebrates that I know of have. And imagine how useful that would be for sending a frogs into space. Like imagine just like in the sci-fi movies, we put people into cryo sleep so they can make a long journey. Maybe these frogs would be the perfect astronauts. So spring peepers, wood frogs, if you haven't heard them yet, wait for a warm day in the case of wood frogs and you might hear them. And if the peepers is usually in the evening in the dusk when they start singing. So you might hear them in the same pond. And something that I hope to include in my next video is the other kind of place where you might look for amphibians besides an established pond. Many of you have probably heard of vernal pools, but that's probably gonna be one of the subjects I cover next time. Vernal pools are ponds that are temporary. Usually in the spring after the snow melts, they build up and they have enough water for creatures to live in it, but these ponds usually dry up by midsummer, which means fish cannot survive in them. And that's incredi incredibly important for some amphibians like salamanders who cannot tolerate fish swimming in their pond because the fish will eat all their eggs and there will be no more salamanders. So some species rely on vernal pools as the safe nursery for their children to grow up in. Other frogs, other species of amphibians like newts can tolerate fish and can grow up in ponds that are permanent. So you can see them in places that always have water, but there is a special class of amphibians that specialize in these places that only temporarily have water. And that's something that you should be looking for this coming week. So don't wait for my video to come out. If you know where there's a vernal pool, or if you think you know a spot that stays wet for maybe half of the summer, but it dries up eventually, that could be a candidate. And right now that vernal pool might be filled with eggs. So that's something I sort of invite all of you to go out and do. Now, unless anybody has any questions popping up, I wanna bring up something else that I mentioned in the video. One of the trees that I talked about that was flowering is the pussy willow. And I mentioned in the video, my poor little bachelor, male tree that didn't seemingly have any female trees nearby. So I was joking about his loneliness. Well, I did a little more searching and I found a few hundred feet away down behind my barn that there is a female pussy willow. So perhaps I was wrong about the lonely bachelor. This is the female plant. And I know for some folks that might be a weird idea, the idea that plants can have male and female, but that's not weird for us, of course, but plants can have it either way. Some plants 
are male and female in the same plant, and some have it separated between different individuals. And you, we usually call that monoaceous, when the female and male are all together, and diaceous, like separated, die too, for when there's male and female on different plants. So willows are diaceous, and here is the feminine willow, the female version. It does not make pollen, but if you can see in the, in the camera here, its flowers look vaguely like the males, but they're much smaller. They're fuzzy, but they're also a tiny bit green. The male starts off as grayish white, and then they become yellow as the stamens emerge and they produce pollen. The pollen is yellow, so you'll see this yellow tint. But the females look greener, and that might help you. And then, I don't know if it's visible on the zoom cam here, but that little structure that's sticking out of one of them and a couple of them, those are pistils. So if you're familiar with your flowers, like a lily, where the pistil is a huge thing in the center, this is the part that hopefully will receive the pollen and the pollen can travel down and fertilize an egg and then becomes a seed. So this is the one that can make seeds. The male that I showed you in the video can make pollen and they need each other to reproduce, but because they emerge at such an early time when there's very few pollinators, these flowers don't do the things that other flowers do, like make fancy colorful petals or delicious attractive smells or give a lot of nectar. There's nothing for bugs to eat here. So this plant can't rely on bugs like butterflies. They're not out yet. And it can't rely on even there, there are flies out, but this creature relies on the wind something that's definitely blowing out there no matter what is going on. And just imagine that male's pollen has been scattering in the fields around my home and around my barn for weeks now. And it's probably landed some in the direction of where this one is. Of course, I had to cut this little branch, but the one that is a female is a larger tree. So this is a small donation. The rest of it is still out there. Hopefully soon, maybe once it gets warm again, getting some of that pollen and turning it into willow seeds. So I hope if you found these willows in your backyard, that you go back and check them every couple of days, especially at this time, because this is all gonna go really fast if it gets warm again. And once we start getting temperatures in the 50s and the nighttime starts staying above freezing, they will accelerate and they'll quickly go through their season. So don't miss it, because a lot of these creatures are in a hurry. They wanna get their business done before other things compete with them. Willows don't want to worry about getting all this other pollen from other species that confuses and maybe makes it more difficult for them to reproduce. So they like the fact that maybe there's less competition in the pollen world. There's only a couple of other trees like the poplars. And maybe a, a, a week from now, the red maples on my land will be bl blossoming. But you know, you'll see when we talk about spring ephemerals, other plants, that there's a schedule to these things in nature because creatures need to be able to work around each other. And if you're a little mayflower, for example, that'll be blooming next month, you don't wanna wait until the leaves on the oaks are full because then you'll be trapped in the shade and you won't have any sunlight. So the springtime is when life is in a hurry. There's a lot of things that are trying to get their cycles completed before the big tsunami of summer comes when so many creatures are out, predators and you know, seed eaters, so many things out there. So there's a lot of plants that are taking advantage of this kind of quiet time when we're just getting the world around us to wake up from winter. So I'm hoping that you folks have some questions. Yes. Are... Oh, I was just gonna say a reminder to everybody out there, you can email me at dbush at fairbanksmuseum.org if you've got questions. You can also, if you're in Zoom, hit up our Q and A box or write in our chat. So, you know, maybe we'll take a couple questions. We've definitely got some time this morning. And um, while we do that, maybe I can ask Bobby, while we get, let people have a chance to think of questions, I should say, maybe I can ask Bobby what, you know, students who are watching this class might expect to find as they go outside next week. And maybe you can give us a hint at you know, I know you've talked about some of it already, but a hint at what you think you'll cover in your video. Oh, it will be pre-recorded. <laughs> oh, I think my next video is going to focus on a little bit less pleasant subject than 
well, all the things we've been talking about. Um, one of the trees I mentioned in the last video was the white ash tree that you saw me standing in. That, that's where my tree house is. And that's a tree that I really love. It's one of my favorite trees. It's such a beautiful type of tree. And unfortunately, there is a risk that we could lose many of our ash trees. And it's, it's a really common theme if you study the history of the forest around here. We've lost our elms to a fungal disease called Dutch elm disease. We lost our chestnuts to a blight that wiped them out. Um, and our beaches, as you saw in the first video, uh, suffer from a fungus that deforms them, but it's not completely fatal. So there is a good hope that eventually the beaches will become immune and have adapt and evolve to that threat. But the ash trees, it's just, I feel, I don't wanna bring any bad news, but the ash trees are really vulnerable to this new invasive species of insect called the emerald ash borer. It is an, a beetle. And we have a really great display at the Fairbanks Museum to help people identify this beetle. But since the public can visit the museum, I'm gonna try to take the information from that display and make it a part of the next video so that those of you who have ash trees on your land can start being diligent about looking for damage or evidence of emerald ash borers. The state is extremely concerned about their spread. And I know that they're already on the Southern part of Caledonia County where Groton is. In fact, in the Groton State Forest, there's already been emerald ash borers detected. So those ash trees, I wanna protect them and the only way we can protect them is by using our eyes and our senses to look for where the emerald ash borer is and reporting it to the state. And then there's a chance that they can contain, oh, doesn't it sound too familiar to all the things we've been talking about, contain this infestation so that it doesn't spread to farther places. Yes, Drew. So one person asking if you do find them on your own property, is there anything you can do while you're waiting for the state to take action? I'm gonna look into those solutions, but what I have already heard is that it is possible to save a single tree, although it is very expensive. You basically have to treat the tree with an insecticide that kills the emerald ash borer. And if it's a very important tree, you could decide that you'd be willing to spend the money to do that, but it's a lot to protect one tree. The problem is 5% uh, of all the trees in our forest are ash trees. And it's almost impossible to go out and treat every tree. I mean, it is impossible from a money perspective and a time perspective to find every ash tree and treat them all with this insecticide. So the only method that has been used is unfortunate is that they have to cull, kill, cut down every ash tree within a certain radius of the infected tree to stop the beetle from being able to hop to another host. And that's how you kind of keep it contained. But that's a very pyrrhic victory. That means you have to cut down all of the beautiful ash trees, hope that the emerald ash borer gets eliminated from the zone and then wait for the ash trees to grow back, which could take 50 to 100 years. So this is a very unhappy solution, not the ideal, but maybe there's hope. One thing that I've heard is that some woodpeckers have been seen eating emerald ash to insect. So our woodpeckers may not yet be accustomed they haven't acquired a taste for them yet but perhaps over time if our woodpeckers learn that emerald ash borers are good food then the woodpeckers could save us they could go out and find the infestations and they could peck them out and eat the the borers before they spread that is maybe not the most likely solution but it is something that is out there nature has its own pesticide it's called you know animals that eat bugs so let's hope that we can get animals that eat emerald ash borers into our woods or train the ones or teach the ones that already live here to help get rid of them. But the other thing I want to possibly mention, this is where I worry about the folks who are watching these videos. Uh, I want you to go out as much as possible, but I can't deny the fact that there is a serious threat of ticks. Now, I know the snow may make you think, oh, the ticks are gone, but ticks actually have a huge spike in their presence during this time of year in April and May. They don't need particularly warm weather. Oh, below freezing might keep them dormant, but it doesn't have to be hot for ticks to come out. And if you're out walking through the woods, you're walking into the, the meadows and you're walking through the wetlands that I hope you find these cool creatures in, those ticks might be hanging out on the ends of branches or little cattail stalks 
with their front legs wiggling around. They're questing like a knight in medieval times. That's the name for it. They're looking for a new victim. And they can actually detect infrared light, which means your body heat as you walk by. So when they stick their little legs out in the front, they're actually looking for you or another host to suck their blood. So I'm gonna teach you how to identify ticks in the coming video. Um, we basically have two species that you can find. One, the wood tick, the dog tick, the more common kind is less of a concern, although there are diseases that can be spread by them. The smaller one, the deer tick, the black-legged tick, that one carries Lyme disease, and that is by far the most serious concern of all the diseases that we can get by ticks. There are other diseases that can be spread by ticks, but the number of cases have been very low, fortunately, but Lyme disease, unfortunately, is not low. It's actually you know, increasing in the number of cases in this region. So in order to make it so that you can still go outside, but be very safe, I'm going to teach you how to identify these ticks and then recommend some places where you can learn about how to protect yourself by doing a tick check and also uh, maybe even thinking about protecting your property. There are methods that you can use to sort of give yourself a tick-free zone around your house so at least you can worry less about playing in your backyard. But anytime you're out in a wild area where there's brush and, and, and trees and tall grass, it's almost a guarantee there's going to be ticks hanging out there too. So please be safe. Please be careful. Get into the habit of doing a daily tick check. Maybe not all of us are showering every day because we're stuck at home. But <laughs> if you shower every day, it's, it's easy to incorporate the daily tick check into your shower because you're already standing there and you're probably standing there naked. So there's easy time to check yourself. But even if you don't take a shower every day, which is okay, please do a tick check every day. Because if you get a tick with Lyme disease and you get it on your body, but then you get it off of your body within 24 to 36 hours, everything I've read says that Lyme disease will not be transmitted in that amount of time. So you have a whole day to get rid of that tick before you can get Lyme disease. So if you do a daily tick check, you're in pretty good shape. But if you wait too long and you find a tick that's been on you for several days, then the transmission of the bacteria that causes Lyme disease may have already occurred. So I don't want to scare anybody because the last thing, the last thing I want is for the tick threat to keep people from going outside. But it's not something that should keep you inside. It's something that should just make you smarter about how you go outside. And we'll talk about that in the video. But you know, if before that comes out, protect your lower legs, it's cold out there still. So you probably will be wearing long pants. But a good trick that I've learned, if you don't have very tall boots to muck around in the mud with, just take your socks and put them over your pant legs and cover your pants and then put on your shoes. You're not going to look that cool. You might look a little like Urkel, but you will be safer from ticks. The ticks that get on your ankle and your shoe, when they crawl up your sock, they will just find more and more fabric. Instead of having a pathway up to your skin, they'll have a pathway up to your pant leg and then they are less likely to get onto your skin and you are more likely to see them crawling on your pants than if they're crawling on your skin. So just simple tricks like that. There is repellent that you can use. I recommend that too, if you're gonna be spending a lot of time outdoors. And there are, for people who are really concerned, there are insecticides that are considered safe to use on your lawn that will eliminate the tick threat on your property, but you can't do that for the whole woods. I wouldn't recommend that because you know, there's other creatures that would be harmed by some of those insecticides and we would wanna take, you know, throw the babies out with the bathwater, so to speak. So let's not let the ticks ruin the fun, but let's be smart about it so that we don't end up, you know, getting sick with Lyme disease. So nobody else has any questions. I wanna know, I want you to know that the last video was informed by some of the questions you had when I added the white ash in there was partly because of a request from someone who participated in one of our live sessions. So if any of you participating now have an idea for something that you would like to see featured in the next videos over the next couple of weeks, let us know. You can send us a message now or email uh, Drew D. Bush at FairbanksMuseum.org, as he just said. But uh, if while you're on here live, this is your chance to ask anything. 
So I know we have some attendees that are participating. If you have a chance to ask a question, this is it. I'm on here live, but I won't be for long. All right, well, I think that was an awesome and very informative session, Bobby. And I know, you know, a lot of folks, including myself, are spending a lot of their time outdoors when they can exercising. So I really appreciate all the warnings you gave about ticks and look forward to the next video that'll help pe people stay educated really about that important topic so that they're safe being outside. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, and I just wanted to thank everybody who has been here with us today in our Zoom meeting or on YouTube or on your local cable station. We look forward to having you join us anytime at fairbanksmuseum.org. So thanks again, Bobby, and I'll see you in a little bit for our next class. All right, thanks, Drew, and thank everybody. Stay safe out there, but go outside as much as you can. <laughs>